Yeah, go ahead and there. Well, welcome to the June eighteenth, uh, two thousand twenty-four session of Tapper and Hamsai technical session. My name is Dave KV0S, and this week uh, I did get my. Uh, K9Q radio moved over to a B link and it's been working until today, of course, but that was not my problem. It was uh, the whisper net is down for a little bit right now. So, um, but that's about it for me. And next on the list is Nathaniel W2NAF. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Dave. It's been a very busy week for me. Uh, I just got back from San Diego. I was there all last week uh, for the NSF CEDAR conference, Coupling Energetics and Dynamics of Atmospheric Regions. It's the big atmospheric uh, physics conference run by the NSF. And um, I think it was extremely successful for uh, for both me and for HAMSA in general. Uh, we had, I had um, nine students there, um, all presenting on HAMSA, um, types of projects and uh Bill Engelke was there and uh he presented as well and uh, I presented a talk on um the uh, KA9Q whisper demon system and on the solar eclipse QSO party observations and um the students presented on those things as well each student also presented posters um, I, I think, and it, it was just very well received. Jesse Alexander was also there along with one of his students and he presented, okay. um, a talk, he presented the invited talk on DEI. So that was really nice to get, um, to have him represent both DEI and really, uh, feature ham radio so prominently, um, at this session. So I think that was very well received also. Um, and then Phil Karn came and visit us, visited us as well. So um, we got to hang out with him uh, all Wednesday afternoon, and then we went to dinner with him, and, and Christina Collins was there, and um, we we went to dinner at a nice German restaurant uh, with him and all of the students, and it it just was a very positive time. So um, I got back uh, Saturday night, um, had a good Father's Day, and uh, now I've been uh, working on um, the LSTID uh, detection, so I've been uh, working with the code that Bill Engelke and Nick Callahan sent me. I've been doing a lot of processing on that, and I will report on that tomorrow morning at at that telecon. Um, still, still working on it. Um, but uh, you know, things are are moving along. So, uh, and where my wife is due with a new baby in uh, about two or three weeks or so, July third officially. We're uh, now taking bets on when the baby is actually going to come. So it's a very busy time in our lives. Yes. <laughs> W2NAF, yeah, back to net. I would say you have a full life. Yes. Uh, now, let's see. Next on the list is Dave, Katie Zero, EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Well, uh, hi. Uh, I'm I'm just here. I, um, I've been doing various things, uh, doing some um, uh, circuit board layout stuff doing trying to get my world a little more integrated including trying to make some stuff for um uh relating to well i'm trying to integrate my own um ham related things into my uh into a home assistant kind of environment along with other things i'm doing trying to get my head around that whole whole business it's not exactly profound but it's a whole nother vocabulary and so forth um but it's a nice presentation of things and um but not much else to be excited about today so back to y'all okay and <clears throat> next on the list is bill a b four e j go ahead bill uh thanks dave <clears throat> Not a whole lot to report. Was at Cedar last week and um, making some progress with uh, Madrigal. We'll report on that in uh, tomorrow's meeting. Also working on a a package to see if we can do what we would call un unsupervised classification of the spot images to see if we can get those to sort. 
they may be able to sort automatically. We'll see. Uh, it's it's kind of complicated to work with, but um, making slow progress. Also, uh, have a new puppy that is uh, quite a distraction as well. So um, just uh, <laughs> hanging in with that. But uh, back to Nick. Okay. Uh, next on the list. Well, we have Michael Naruda uh, jumped in there, AA8K. Do you have any comments, Michael? Oh, uh, greetings to everyone uh, listening. Back to you, Dave. Okay. And then we have uh, Bill in 8ET. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, okay. I don't have too much here. It's been a long time since I've been on on this uh, gathering on Monday night. And uh, so I had to check in and see what's going on. I did buy some magnetometers when I was down at Dayton. I managed to get them home and I haven't lost anything yet. So they're on a, by the chair on the table by the television. And I've been looking at them and so trying to figure out how to get the cable from inside the shack to outside where I buried the whole mess in the yard. So I'll uh, be looking for help with this stuff when I get to it sometime with all the other stuff I've got going on here when we get ready for field day. So that's about it for now and we'll see you next week. Back to you. Well, very good. Glad you checked in. Uh next on the list is uh Dave W six O Q. Go ahead, Dave. Good evening everyone. Um so I've been uh <clears throat> hanging around Ham's High and stuff for a couple years here and presently hosting one of the grape twos uh, out in uh, Los Angeles and I see that we're getting started with uh, defining uh, a new uh, radio to replace the grape and other things so uh, I'm interested in seeing what I can do to help with that from the technical side. Very good. Uh, there's always things to do, <laughs> and uh, it's interesting to see where these things move to. So, uh, next on the list is David McGaw in one HAC. Go ahead, David. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, I was actually at Cedar, but remotely, uh, virtually, which uh, I got most of it. There were some sessions that weren't, didn't have a link to them, but. Uh, um, got a lot out of it, um, both in terms of what um, I might be doing. I'm actually, I've been asked to uh, work on a um, citizen science project that I hope dovetails well with what we're doing um, and has some notable additions. Um, but, um, you know, I was listening for what other people are doing in that regard and also uh, what it is that we're trying to study. And there are some very interesting things that go on out there that the, the one thing, uh, one note that I would have um, is I felt that there was a, a great dearth of uh, radio. I mean, Super Darn, which is a radar uh, was mentioned and some of the other radars, but what we do, I didn't think it was really represented because people don't understand what we can see yet. But uh, that's up to us to to to, uh, uh, to work on. Um, you know, I very much am a believer in us being able to sound the ionosphere with our signals and signals of opportunity. Um, and one other note, I'll just say that uh, propagation has been continuing to be pretty wacky. Um, I don't know if other people yeah. have been following it personally, but... Uh, Signals come in and go, and uh, 25 megahertz is a particular interest to me from WWV. It's coming in very weakly right now, but most of the time it's just not there when it should be. So ever since our uh, big, um, the May 10th geomagnetic storm, our ionosphere is really uh, disturbed. And um, yes. that's a matter of study. So back to that. Yep. Uh I think this is the uh, disturbances of opportunity that is not as well timed as a, an eclipse, but it's actually probably much more interesting. <laughs> and certainly uh, more ongoing. Yes. Next on the list, let's see. 
Uh, Don, W9BPZ. Don, are you there? I am. Yeah. Welcome. So, greetings from, uh, Fort, from Fort Collins, Colorado, home of WWB. Um, I'm fairly new on, um, on ham side, so I don't think I have a whole lot to contribute tonight, but it's interesting to see what everyone do. So, um, so carry on. Okay. Back to Very that. good. So, uh, next on the list is Franco, K4VZ. Go ahead, Franco. Yeah, good evening, everyone. A uh, couple of things. First of all, congratulations to Nathaniel for his uh, baby. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully, he or she gets a new call sign soon. And I also <laughs> sent a, <laughs> a link earlier to the um, Software Defined Radio Academy. I see that uh, both Rob and Phil are presentation there, so it be interesting. It's going to yes. be Friday, not next Friday, but the one after. And then uh, uh, my update is that I've been working on Phil Harman and Justin Peng um, DFC uh, prototype, and I was able to uh, connect to the DAC and basically send uh, 100 megabit per se 100 mega sample per second samples out. Uh, one thing I found out is I learned how to use the FX3, which probably is going to become useful for when we do the, the radio with them. Um, uh, Tom and Dane and uh, Dave because uh, there are some tricks there that learn about how to send continuous sample there so that's a good progress everything I've been doing and so on is posted on GitHub so in case somebody's interested they can find it there uh, back to you Dave well very good and thanks for doing that Franco next on the list is uh, Jamal go ahead hello 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 everyone. Hello from Egypt. Hello, uh, Mr. Nathaniel. I'm I'm really glad that I finally could attend because it's it's about four four fourteen a.m. here. Oh, okay. <laughs> from my local time. Yeah. Um. My news is I have I have two two pieces of news. The first one is that uh, thanks to Hamsaik community, uh, I finally decided to specialize in analog RF and IC design in an Very degree good. that I pursued at the American University in Cairo. Thanks to Hamsai, because without, uh, without joining Hamsai, uh, I would never decide to be specialized in RF, uh, analog and IC design as a communication engineer. Yes. The second one is that um, I, I, I'm, I'm finally uh, getting finished from uh, a recent publication, uh, which is entitled Advancement in Local Oscillator Design for enhanced terrestrial and space weather forecasting. Actually, actually, it, it goes around um, enhancement of local oscillator uh, uh, for better performance of, of the Doppler rather. Yes. Uh, actually, it, it, it's being operating at, at very, very low voltages, which, which is about 1.4 volts. Uh, and some, some details are in, but actually it is in the, the RF uh, and analog IC design. Yeah. Well, very good. Congratulations. Thank you. So, uh, is it, are you done with your comments? Uh, for me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, Thanks. we'll go on down the list. Uh, please hang around and talk when we get to general discussion. Uh, next on the list, we have Jay Schwartz. He sa said he was listening, so I think he didn't really need to make any comments. Um, then we have Joe W7LUX. Go ahead, Joe. Good evening, everyone. Been uh, monitoring propagation. And all I can say is I have to agree with David. It's been uh, up and down and very, very different. The um, 75 meter situation has been especially uh, unpleasant or poor out here. Submitted comments to the FCC about, the, about what I heard during the geomagnetic storm. That's pretty much it from uh, from Flagstaff. Thanks. Oh. Okay. Next on the list is John W-I-6-P. Go ahead, John. Good evening, everyone uh, from the Puget Sound. I'm uh, 
sitting here monitoring, listening to all of the activity, very interesting stuff going on. I'm still trying to get my uh, RX-888 uh, Whisper Demon set up uh, demoning, but uh, haven't been very successful at this point. And I am keeping the uh, Grape One, DRF, and uh, Fladigi stations online and uh, see some very interesting things, but I haven't yet seen any systematic analysis of uh, some of the things that we're seeing that people are referring to uh, here with regard to the state of the ionosphere following the, um, the storm. So uh, that's it, back to Ned. Oh, very good. And uh, next on the list is Jonathan, KC3EEY. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, hi, uh, everybody. Um, I've been uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, busy with my uh, um, my uh, Adele Wise 57 Thin client uh as as my vlf uh, signal processor um i've been uh doing some administrative tasks in uh debian linux uh setting up sudo uh boot messages uh one of the things that i didn't realize at first was um a lot of the uh i guess what linux calls legacy commands uh, like if config is is now something completely different it's ip um so i'm getting used to that because i don't really use linux um, um i uh, much prefer free bsd but the problem is is that um uh their audio drivers are not also compatible so they uh, don't work with uh uh vt card and uh VLFRX tools, so I, so I won't be able to capture from the sound card. Uh, so I'm I'm using uh, Debian Linux because it's uh, small, thin, lightweight. Um, I don't have any uh, desktop manager or a window manager installed. Um, it's the thin client has a Intel Celeron processor, um, one and a half gigahertz, four core. Uh, bursts up to 2.5 gigahertz, four gigabytes of RAM, um, uh, gigabit ethernet, um, and 16 uh, gig uh, eMMC flash. And um, it, it, it's been performing extremely, extremely well. Uh, to, to review the main reason why, why that I got it was, was because it had a hardware serial port, uh, which uh, works, works with... Um, uh, the pulse per second signal uh, and GPS daemon. I'm using, so I uh, downloaded and compiled GPS daemon. I uh, got that running. Um, I'm also using NTP sec instead of NTP. That's the secure version of NTP. It's a fork. Um, it's maintained by the same group as GPS daemon. One of the benefits um, other than the security, uh, is that you can do um, visualization of your uh, uh, network timing system. Uh, so the plan is, because I also have Apache running on this, is I want to have a minimalistic web interface. So you could consider it like a, a VLF appliance. So it has a minimalistic web interface um, I could view visual, uh, visualizations generated by data from NTPSEC um, and, and uh, logs and other sorts of things in, in a lightweight web interface. I was thinking something uh, PHP. I do need, um, if anyone would be interested, I'm, um, uh, if you have experience with uh, writing uh, lightweight web interfaces, something that could run on an appliance, uh, minimalistic. Uh, if you have in, um, have any experience in that or interest, uh, let me know. And lastly, um, I I completed the um, the uh, final uh, portion of the um, 
system diagrams of my new VLF system. Uh, this is the uh, VLF interface box. So what this does is, is the VLF receivers uh, that are installed outside the E field, and if you have it, the B field, um, uh, VLF receivers, their feed lines come in through uh, CAT5 or CAT6 and go into this box. So one pair, um, one pair of the CAT6 um, uh, drives the, uh, is, is, is the DC loop pair that provides uh, power to the, to the VLF preamp. And then the other pair is the signal. Uh, that's for the uh, E field uh, section, the uh, B field section on the bottom here. Uh, that also has a DC to DC converter in both cases, 24 or 48 volts to accommodate different uh, feed line lengths, uh, especially far, far feed line lengths um, to uh, cover, cover, cover the voltage drop over the um, all of the the uh, I squared R losses from a uh, you know a couple hundred feet uh, feed line um, and I also have the uh, um, the uh, signal pair uh, for the uh, or the signal pairs for the um, uh, B field orthogonal loops and um, the signals are the uh, uh, signal pairs are all isolated using um, triad SP70 audio isolation transformers, um, and the outputs will connect to um, I'm thinking RCA jacks, uh, but it could be anything um, that's on the box, and then they will connect to the Behringer UMC 404 or 202 HD. USB audio interface to uh, capture the signal. Um, so this is this is pretty much what the box is going to be. It's going to be very simplistic. Um, there's there's just going to be some circuit. Oh, there's also going to be a circuitry um, uh, bleeder resistors as, as well as uh, um, uh, um, a single and double pole uh, gas uh, discharge arresters um for each e each of the lines um every pair uh to protect it from uh any surges due to local thunderstorms um that's uh so i'm i'm uh um i'm gonna work on actually building this up getting an actual schematic and uh, uh getting it ready for prime, prime time uh that's all i have back to the net okay uh, next on the list is Michael, AC0G. Go ahead, Michael. Hello, everybody. Not much to report here. I spent uh, most of the past week preparing for my mother's 90th birthday celebration, which was really, really great. Back to that. Okay. And next on the list is... Phil, K9Q. Go ahead, Phil. Hi, everyone. Uh, not a whole lot to report in the last week. Uh, I've been uh, preoccupied with uh, with medical stuff. But I hope to have that out of the way pretty soon and uh, back to uh, back to working on stuff. I have called off my trip to uh, Fruiter Shop, and though I'd hope to be there. Back to group. Okay, is somebody going to present what you would say or? Yeah, Rob Rob will be there. I'm going to be working with him. Okay. I good. hope to appear by telecom, but I don't want to promise anybody anything and not be able to do it. Yeah. Very good. Uh, next on the list is Scott, uh, N5TNL, and he usually doesn't have a mic. Yes, still no mic. And then we have Tom in 5EG. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, good evening, Dave. Um, uh, to Nathaniel, we've, I've got version 0 0.3 of the requirements document up on the site. It's been reviewed by John Ackerman for the clock uh, data. And uh, I have a link that's the editor link, but I don't know if there's a different kind of a link that just lets people view and download. If you could send that, I'll copy that. 
you probably sent it before and I missed it. Um, so folks who want to look at the requirements document can download. Um, I talked with Franco and Dave a bit and put together first thoughts on uh, hardware architecture for the uh, next gen receiver. And it's going to take a lot more work before it's half baked because uh, the FX10 uh, product brochure leaves, <laughs> leaves a lot to the imagination. <laughs> so um, I looked through that document and there's, you know, it's, it's interesting. You can write IO descriptions that can be read five different ways if, uh, if you're in marketing. And so <laughs> uh, until we get a little bit better details um, on what the FX10 IO looks like, we have a couple of irons up in the air. Um, the architecture document's pretty rough. When we get a little better, I'll upload that to the document site as well. And uh, back to the group. Okay. And have I called on everybody? I believe so. But uh, just want to, if you had some comments and I didn't call on you, please let me know. And if not, then we're open for general discussion. Nathaniel, did you have any things you particularly wanted to discuss? Um, sure. I'd love to keep talking with uh, Tom about moving forward on the uh, uh, design documents so I can give him the uh, the links he asked for and we can decide um, if it makes sense to go over those documents again tonight or just figure out what the next steps are. I, I do have one thing to touch base with Jonathan on when we uh, get a chance. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dave, one thing I to um, talk with Don uh, W9BPZ. Yes, we did. Uh, okay, I must have missed it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you did hear from me. Thank you. Very, very good. Your your um, your still photo sure. and your live photo look a little different. Well, there's <laughs> about fifty years difference there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tom, did you have a question for him? Uh, no, no. Just wanted to make sure nobody got left off the list. Yeah. So. Tom, I have a question real quick. Um, is the uh, USB 3 and uh, this new uh, Cypress chip, are they so much different that we can't have a design that uh, we start with one and then switch to the other when it's available? Um, well, yeah, the... Um... I think the FX10 and the FX3 are going to be very similar parts. At least that's the hope yeah. that they are. The difference, um, as far as I can tell, and Frank is really the expert here, is the I.O. ports on the FX10. The FX10 will support 10 gigabits. And if we want to support four receiver channels, we're going to need on the order of seven and a half to eight gigabits of USB throughput and the FX3 uh, won't go quite that fast. But the IO ports, um, I think, are the difference between the parts, or at least one of the differences between the parts. And so we're, we're kind of scratching our heads. Should we do it with a real tiny FPGA with no intellectual property? Can we do it with discrete logic gates? You know, we're kind of debating what the possibilities are there. Uh, oh. To do what, Tom? Um, so in the receiver, if there's four channels equipped, you've got to ingest four synchronous ADC uh, channels at, you know, if we go up to 60 megahertz, 120 mega, mega words per second and get all of that over a USB at 10 gigabits to a host computer. And so there's going to be some logic required to ingest all of that into 32 bits of IO on the FX10. Yeah, the big question is, would there be uh, too much capacitance on the line to do it, uh, just tri-stating? 
to multiplex well, yeah, it. The, yeah, the ADCs, um, I don't know if they have tri-state outputs. However, there they is do. logic. They uh, do. Okay. The, they do. There is logic. Um, you can use some logic to do multiplexing. There is also, um, we the spec is unclear enough to me to know exactly uh, how you get the input, uh, CMOS inputs into the part the DDR inputs are similarly a little bit vague. And so we're kind of, you know, once we know a little bit more about what that looks like, it should be easier to derive, um, you know, various approaches to get all that you know, ingested onto the IO parts. Yeah, I would certainly think we should focus on FX3 to start to prototype, move to FX10 down the road. Yeah, the, the three is, is uh, I think only going to support two receivers. Right. Yes, I'm aware of that. But just getting two channels going would be a plus. Yeah. yeah so, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tom. No, no, go ahead, Frank. You've got a lot more experience. Yeah, a couple of this. comments, uh, Dave, because basically that's what I've been doing with Phil Harman, DFC. So, first of all is, yeah, we can do the FX3 with two channels up to 100 mega a sample per second. And is known to work and basically what you do you can put the two again when i talk about the um adc i mean the ltc 2208 because that's pretty much what everybody uses so 16 bit 130 mega sample per second right yeah and is that actually those... hmm? do we actually have hardware of that yeah, i do have on my desk is this dfc with phil Harmon and uh, justin pang that does exactly that so i've, okay, I've been great. running that you know for some test of all the software and it, it does work and long story short is it can do 100 mega sample per second in 32 bits or in two L, uh, adcs or i can push it up to 150 and 60 mega sample per second with a single adc i tried that and it seems like that 2208 can uh, can I mean at least mine can run that. Right. When we count to four, is a different picture though, David. Yes, getting it through okay. a single interface would be right. So with four, I can see as top. Okay, so the specs of the FX10 we know are the following: in uh, CMOS mode, it can run up to 160 mega sample per second, 32 bit. So, which means if we have four, you could run each of them at about 80 mega sample per second, okay? Which is not, uh, you know, not uh, negligible, but it's not the best you can do on a 2208. Now, in um, what's it called? Differential LVDS mode, it's the spec says you can get 1.25 gigabit per second times 16. So we think in that scenario, we should be able to run it faster and you know, get to full uh, sample rate, except that uh, we need to put something quote in between to be able to match those four uh, ADCs to the FX10. Makes sense what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. Now, this so uh, what you're saying uh, is that mode is not in the FX3, so we cannot uh, you know, tell you what it's going to look like. No one knows. Right. I mean, unless you have it, the, the 10. Um, now, what you're saying is you have to run LVDS in to get the full rate, and you're not sure it's how to multiply that. The, again, the specs are two, uh, two pages PDF. That's all we have. I can send you the link, Dave, if you want to double check. <laughs> okay. Maybe yeah, please. we're missing something, but that's all we know for now. And from that, it sounds like if you want to get the full speed, that's what you have to do. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, CMOS is slow. Yeah, now both Tom and I found out and a noisy. couple of approaches uh, with discrete components. I found a very cheap uh, lattice uh, FPGA, you know, I'm talking about $10, $15 each, that could possibly do the same, you know, but you have a lot of ports to deal with because each. Uh, um, what we call each ADC in differential mode is 32 pins. So if you do 32 times four, it makes, you know, 128 plus the 32 pins going to the FX3, FX10. So you have about 160 pins just for the IO, you know, without even talking overflow, uh, PPS or anything like that. So right. we, we are talking about, you know, a lot of IO, a lot of pins for IO. Not really complicated logic, but a lot of IO pins. Now, the LVDS 
drivers don't do tri-state? Okay, so the 228 can do tri-state. I was able to do it on my model, on my um, prototype, but I they didn't put any LVDS in my, so I don't know for the LVDS part if it's okay, I mean, if it works or not. But right. there's a shutdown pin uh, that you can bring high, and when you bring that high, it goes in tri-state. Right. Yeah, the whole trick is to um, run the... Uh... The wires uh, so that you can. There is a catch, uh, which is going from tri-state to out to tri-state takes a bit. So you can really count on on flipping uh, that tri-state on and off like crazy. You know? uh, okay. <laughs> you can... So you basically, if you want to start fast and, and furious, you have to basically figure out a an FPGA, a CPLD way to, to get everything out uh, as quick as you can. That's and what I figure out. You haven't found an LVDS multiplexer? There are a bunch of uh, uh, very cheap FPGA that they seem to be able to do either LVDS or something that they call okay. emulation LVDS. Honestly, uh, right. if you know more about that, that will be interesting to learn from you. Yeah, I'm just... I'm surprised that uh, you have to go to an FPGA to do this simple function. Okay, so this is what happened. So CPLD used to be the way to the simple function. It looks like the CPLD concept has kind of died off in the 2010, 2015s, and no one, no, no one anymore calls them CPLDs. They call them cheap FPGA. But you can basically get... Uh, an FPGA with maybe, you know, a couple of thousand LUTs and do the same thing at, uh, you know, I look at the, uh, on DigiKey, they were like $10, $20 each. I can send you okay. a couple of links of well, those. that kind of price, ones. yeah, it doesn't make sense to. So that point far. is no point to go to a component that was discontinued 10 years ago for something that is still on the market. You know, I saw that. Mac X O three family from Redis was one of the option, very inexpensive and perhaps can fit the bill. Right. Yeah, so, I Tom, I didn't mean to uh, take over your your conversation. Oh no, that's fine. That's uh, that's that's exactly right. We just we have just been talking about various approaches. There are some. 8 and 16 bit wide um, SSI components that might might assist in reducing the data width and they're in the dollar two dollar price range um, but you know the question is can you switch them fast enough and if you need a whole bunch of those parts then um, then the FPGA starts to look more attractive so without the details of the spec of the um, FX10 it's a little premature to know the answer. <clears throat> One question, uh, Franco, the LVDS interfaces, are these still parallel or is it running high-speed serial? It seems to be parallel from what I see both in the specs of the FX10 and in the way that 228 works, they seem to be all, you know, 16 bits in parallel. Right. Another advantage of using a cheap, you know, very expensive LPGA, FPGA is that you could actually uh, rewire your connection. So, for instance, just give an example. Let's say someone needs only 12 bits, then you can combine 12 bits into 24 bits and maybe get even higher throughput. I don't know if it makes sense or not. You know, so you yeah. can mix and match almost dynamically what you want to do, you know, what you... But it's all yeah, up in not up in the air, but you know, still yeah, just, being. Uh, it just uh, and it sounds like this is sort of um, behind the curve re with respect to where uh, memory re interfacing is, where they're running on multiple edges and whatnot. Yeah, uh, that's the DDR that Tom was talking about, uh, right? Yeah, that's right, what yeah. you're referring to. Yeah, it can the, the FX tank can do that too. Uh -huh. Yeah, but the, do the, the uh, C's do it is the question. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, can we have a good uh, sampling if we sample the two ADCs at one clock and the other two ADCs half, half a clock afterwards? I mean, I don't know, actually. Right.
it's going to be fun. Yeah. I, I'll look in more into the 2208, but I expect it's got a buffering in there so that you can, what your sample clock is, it can be separate to your uh, output clock. I think so. I need actually to see what the, uh, what you call the, the restriction on timing are on the 2208, which honestly I haven't really read the, the data sheet enough to know uh, if you can actually, you know, get through it uh, enough, fast enough that you can get the same, uh, you know, the same, the same uh, clock, you know. Yeah, there is a bunch of unknowns, uh, David, that we are, you know, honestly, right. we just know what we know. <laughs> You're laughing, Dave. <laughs> I, I, I There's am, the uh, things that we, there, we know what we know, do know, and there are the things that we don't know that we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I, we don't know, honestly, is what's going to be the pricing and the marketing on this FX10, you know, because I know we are looking for it, you know, everybody's looking for it. So I'm afraid the initial is going to be, you know, maybe it's going to be expensive. I don't know. So, so if I understand this right, the FX10 is the commercial USB controller that's going to give us a high bandwidth USB 3. Yeah. And is this the next generation of the FX3? Right. The and FX3 thing... container has been around for 10 years or maybe 12 years, you know, so it's kind of starting to get obsolete. Okay. So yeah. Cypress, which now is becoming Fineon, came out with FX10, okay. which utilizes the new uh, version of USB called USB 3.2 Gen 2, which okay. is the 10 mega uh, gigabit per sample. Uh, gigabit uh, interface. Right. So everybody's looking to that. They announced in November of last year. Some lucky people have samples, so that we know it's not vaporware. But uh, <laughs> our mere mortals are waiting for the company to, you know, let us know more about it. That's where we are. Makes who sense. Are, who are these so right unlucky the people? Documentation, the documentation. Oh, a guy that makes a camera called the Leopard Imaging. If you look at them, they already have that. A few other folks, their rumor has, they have it. And uh, everybody else is just waiting for this thing to come out. Yeah. What were you saying, So Tom? we know it's going to come out, but we don't know how much it's going to cost, exactly what it can do, the SDK. So we are all getting ready to... Yeah, I'm, I'm, look, with it. I'm looking at their website and they have a forum where it says register and be the first to get the data sheet and updates yeah, me, on the... me, yeah, David, they... a bunch of other here waiting, you know, we already registered and everything. So <laughs> we're just, uh, you know, it's going to be the next big thing. I mean, maybe, yeah. hopefully. Yeah, so, so right Connor. now the part, the part is real and the documentation is vaporware. Hmm. So I, I yeah. found a video about it where someone was talking about somebody internal at Cypress or at uh, Infineon, but it was it was kind of painful to listen to because it didn't it didn't have much additional information, and it was um, well it was less than polished. I'll put it that way. The presentation mm -hmm. it wasn't from marketing. It didn't seem like. So does it? So I guess the RX triple eight that uses the um, FX three, yes, correct. Okay. So so no. so is it the idea that we don't want to, or we can't really develop? So I guess we have two options. We can either develop something based on the FX three, but yeah. it's not going to be as performant as maybe we want it to be. Or yeah. we can wait for the FX10, where but we don't know when that's actually but, going to come. But we can look for another uh, another path. Okay, to accomplish the same thing, and that's yes. what Tom and Franco have been doing. Mm. Especially, uh, that's what they're talking about with uh, discrete um, uh, handling, or else a, a very small FPGA. Very, very small FPGA. So you would use that to re replace? So you'd use yeah, that in yeah. place of the uh, 
attack yeah. no no let, let me say uh, the old um, let me explain a tenure because maybe help okay okay so if you do a quick bit of math okay right you see that the, the typical adc we use is a called ltc 228 which you probably heard many times from us okay right if you go look in the data sheet for that uh, is able to do 130 mega sample per second and 16 bits okay right so far okay now, it actually, I think it can do 150, but, you know, that's debatable, but it's still, I think, what I, if you do the math and you put two of them because you want to do diversity reception, then the number is higher than the throughput of uh, USB 3.0 Gen 1, okay? okay. Which is what uh, the FX3 can do, okay? Okay. So if you want to get full advantage of the architecture that Dave, uh, Tom, and I are working on, you need to go the next level up, okay. which is this FX10, which again has been promised that we know it's not vaporware. It's going to, you know, people already have it, but it's going to be, I suspect, six months uh, or, or less maybe in the in the GA, before it goes GA. Okay. And we're, yeah, right, at the I was, we're right at the point where, where, we can accept the, the kind of what just a, a polished version of what we already have or go to the next step and it, you know we keep hoping that every every day we'll wake up and and the other shoe will drop um obviously these things are out there you know there really seems to be almost a marketable product out there based on it but probably there are some, you know, they, they're polishing it up somehow. Yeah. Um, I wanna, uh, sorry, go finish, David. And then no, that's one that's thing. really the. It's just that we're in that dilemma of of uh, you know, there are things that some some potential users of this really want, like like four channels or something that might be very easy to provide. If we either had this FX10 or if we had another path, um, and uh, do we, you know, it's kind of well, what do you do? But right now we're waiting for the FX10, so there isn't anything really that we can do except yeah, uh, paper there, there design. A... Can we polish up the uh, current two channel design? Yeah, let me finish one thing. I, I want to tell that tenure because it will make sense then of that. Okay, so. Nathaniel, let's assume that you have four ADCs, you know, streaming all together, okay? Under 30 make a sample per second or something, okay? Mm -hmm. The FX10, though, is not able to take those streams exactly as they are. There is a little bit of impedance mismatch, you know, between the two, okay? So when we discussed that with Dave and Tom like last week in our conversation, we thought that there are a couple of approaches for that thing, quote, in between. One is a very simple FPGA, again, in the $10, $15 cost, or some discrete components to, you know, make the two all together. Make, make sense what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, that, so there will be three pieces. The ADCs, you know, standard at 2208s or something like that, similar. Okay. Of course, I'm not talking about the clock and that kind of stuff. And then something between that's still to be defined, and then the FX10, which talks USB to the host, you know, and then, of course, K9Q radio and the usual mm -hmm. stack we already yeah. have, you know. So those are, we are still in the phase of trying to figure out uh, the, the unknowns in this equation, you know. Yeah. Now one is the FX10 and one is what's in between. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And, the, you know, sorry, Dave, I didn't mean to, uh, Dave, my God, I didn't to interrupt you. I just want to finish this conversation so we are on the same page. Yeah, I we think um, that the software on the FX10 uh, will be very similar to that on the FX3. You know, so Franco's done a lot of work on the driver there. So it's advantages. It wouldn't be a huge leap. From, now, is the FX10 the same size chip? It's a different uh, I think but honestly uh i have to look uh, would I can, it have I'm more ports the link uh, dave eh? would it have uh, more ports or is it the same number of ports i, I don't have the same a, number to be honest we don't have a we don't have a proper data sheet on it uh you know um i can't remember what we do have but i guess we know. gotta get friendly with the reps 
I, we don't even know how that's done anymore. You know, it <laughs> yeah. used, to be, good you question. used to be, you used to, you know, call up and harass them until they gave you, um, assigned you to a, a field engineer to hold your hand a little well, bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm used but, to talking with the field engineers and having them call on me. That It's been a while. Yeah, they, they, they went away as far as I can tell, you mm -hmm. know, or if they're there, they're, they they keep them locked up somewhere, <laughs> um, and uh, that seems to you know it just isn't the way business seems to be done anymore, uh, or at least we haven't been able to identify one. Where uh, as we've done everything we know uh, of so far to be in the way yeah. of something like that should it come along, what? but we're not a pre-existing big customer. Like some of these cameras. Yeah, guys. but well, my experience has been able to be, um, even though we weren't a big customer, we were a very visible customer uh, yeah. back when I was in high end uh, professional audio. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got uh, a lot of support that you wouldn't expect. But uh, I guess uh, these days you have to have your AI get in touch with their AI. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and imagine compatible things, I guess. But I don't know. You wanna? You if wanna hear something to funny, Dave? Eh? If anyone knows how to navigate the realities of these kinds of situations uh, these days, I'd well, love to hear about it. Well, I know Scotty was pretty good at that, and he is interested in getting back in with things. Uh huh. Well, you know, we we just we ought to ask him. Everybody's either not been in that position, or is been in that position, but it's long ago enough that it's done kind of differently now. People moved into, you know, didn't get their hands dirty for a while, and there you we are. Certainly had his our hand in for the uh, FPGAs. So uh, yeah, well, we only had one person, and. <laughs> He's absent and all, you know, we just, we don't, we, yeah. we don't, we can't, can't, you know, that's not a pat, an avenue. As far as I can do you, Sorry, Dave, do you want to hear something funny? <laughs> What's Look that? at the link I just sent about, they came out four days ago with the FX5. They did. <laughs> yeah. Which apparently has uh, 16 data lanes. I'm just reading really now fresh and 32 bit uh, under 60. So maybe that's another. Um, I, I'll have to. Again, uh, Nathaniel, things are evolving by the day here, by the hour. <laughs> yes. So but... uh, I give you something and then I found something else. Actually, but... that's re really funny because, like, I was just Googling and I found the one, the product brief for the fx10 and then i clicked on your link for the fx5 and i didn't realize they were different documents until you said something yeah, they are. So, yeah. so it's all new you know it's evolving by the day here so mm -hmm. fx10 we knew about because it came out three months you know six months ago but the fx5 is something i just found out tonight huh. i mean uh... and they have been what i have heard in the last you know 10 days has been they're talking about both 10 gig and 20 gig uh though that may be a specialized application so they may not even know their marketing positioning on this yet um uh, they may be marketing may be hard at work on this right now <laughs> hmm. you know limiting the clocks on some of them or something Yeah, that is done. So we'll give you update as we move on. And, or, or if you find anything, you know, Dave, if you have any contact with Infineon or someone that can help us, definitely be interesting to us. Anyone, yeah. Franco, can I ask, could you uh, clarify the market that the DFC project you're working on is trying to uh, approach. What what's the end user like? 
Uh, right now is just a prototype. So uh, just to give you a history of what happened since maybe it was back in, uh, when was Dave? Uh, January, I think. Uh, let me see, now we are in June. January, probably. Phil Harman, VK6PH, contacted me and Dave say, hey, I have an idea for something, you know, that could be interesting to make. And he was thinking about something that can do both receive and transmit. Okay, Hi. so... And, uh, you know, he, I initially think he contacted, what's the name of the guy at uh, Enan, um, Abid or something, I forgot. Uh, uh, yeah, Abid. Abid, 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 Abid okay. and also Ping. Yeah. yeah, he contacted Abby initially, and Abby said, yeah, it sounds interesting, maybe I'll help you. And then, you know, I don't know if he heard or not from him later on, uh, I posted a message on the next uh, generation SDR group about this idea uh, back then. And then this Justin Pang, which I think is the same guy that is behind the right. RX-888 and behind right. the TRX duo, said, oh, this sounds like a good idea. And he has you know, some familiarity with uh, uh, RF design. So he basically worked on that, and I think there was Chinese New Year in between, so, you know, he had some time. And then around the end of March, he had this kind of prototype uh, built by JCPLD, and he sent me one of the two, I think there are two or three prototypes in the whole universe, you know, and one is on my desk here, okay? And he said, hey, Franco, I need your help in writing the software for the FX3 because the core of it is the FX3. So starting back at the end of March, I started figuring out how it works, writing the software. I'm still working on that, yes. but it's still a three-board prototype, you know, three-instance uh, prototype that we have here uh, that I don't know has been really uh, defined uh, what it's going to be or not. And honestly, I haven't really told to Phil Harmon, you know, the guy behind it in uh, a month or two. So I don't know exactly yes. what is the plan. I just have, I like to have fun, you know. Yes. That's, it's my hobby, you know. And I'm well aware of the project he had some years ago with the same name. And uh, it was generally working, but there were some uh, implementation issues that caused some problems, and that's why they, and then COVID came along and uh, interrupted lots of things, too, so, but. Uh, so, uh, I, go ahead, sorry, Dave. Well, I had heard a rumor that uh, Phil was looking at both uh, an RX TX design and potentially a two RX design. Is that still true, or is he only focusing on the RX TX? Uh, right now, you probably would. Uh, I would have to tell you, you have to ask Phil because oh. <laughs> uh, he, I haven't really spoke to him or emailed him in quite a bit, and I don't know. I mean, I'm just being writing this after so. The board I have, the board with the motherboards, has two ADCs and one DACs. So it's okay. RX and TX. Now, the tricky part is that Phil at one time said, oh, I want to try to see with FX3 alone if we can do full duplex, RX and TX, because he wants right. to try to do something similar to pure signal, where you get the fit, you know, the, the thing that Warren uh, right. Pratt designed. Yeah, okay. Right. And I strongly suspect you can't because okay. FX3, you know, it's FX3. I mean, you can't really expect uh, to do everything and, and the kitchen sink. So I don't <laughs> think he's going to be able to, to do everything that he wants. I, again, I suspect that there will be needs to be some FPGA or something in between because otherwise you can manage it. But, uh, you know, for now, I'm just still writing soft and try to get the best performance and try to so, see how it works. So what I'm suggesting is we're depending on you that we don't pick up something that's redundant. What do you mean? Eh? Oh, no, this is between okay. the two projects. Right. No, no. And I see your point. I think this is just I mean, at this point is for fun and you know i don't think uh, i don't know what's going to happen to it i mean if you are trying to to ask me i, I don't know yes 
I was just uh, curious if you were making great strides or just. No, I'm making Working progress, I, honestly, but again, <laughs> I, for instance, I sent them an update last night, you know, all the progress I did with the DFC and so on, but I haven't heard anything back. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, almost one way sometimes, you know, yes. and I'm writing a signal generator for it so I can test it with various signal configurations. But I think most of my expertise that I'm learning now can be used for the FX10, yes. you know, assuming that that's the way, or FX5, or whatever it's going to be, you know. Yeah. Uh, I suspect that Infineon will not change the, their interface that much because they yeah. have to retain existing customers, you know. They can't right. really say, throw everything away and start from scratch, you know. I, not right. I mean, we are not really, you know, that. But on the other hand, you know, as long as they can have fun here, I don't mind. Yes, mm -hmm. it sounds like a fun project. I mean, I know it's not I mean, it's my hobby, you know. So whenever I, you know, I could play golf instead, instead of stuff. It sounds, this is more interesting to me. <laughs> or collecting stamps, you know. <laughs> that kind of person. Please helping us, yes. Huh? Please, please, we, we appreciate your efforts, please. Yeah. <laughs> And again, there is uh, what's his name, um, Glenn Elmore too. That has yes. some idea that I think they're very interesting because if you remember, Davey came out with the Strowman uh, dual ADC project uh, idea. I don't know if you remember, like back in August, I think. Yeah, you remember that, Dave? Right? Dave yeah, uh, Dave Whitney. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, th there's a lot of interesting things going on. And it, at this point, it's not clear uh, what what's next. Or Yeah, that's a we, very good point, Dave, yeah. And, and we, we know the designs will work if we can find the right place to put it. But, um, but it's still... There's a, a lot of unknowns we're waiting on. I mean, if I have to give you my gut feeling, again, this is a, a personal feeling, it will come out with something, uh, sorry, the, 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 the one that will win will be the one that is able to um, contain the cost and get the best performance for the right. cost. You know, remember mm -hmm. when I started... Talk about the Model T of uh, wideband SDR. I think that um, personal again. This is not right. uh, personal opinion is going to come to that because it's going to find so many other applications. You know, maybe molecular biology. I don't even know. Yes. You know that we don't think. And people say, oh, for you know, hundred dollars, I can do this. That you know, uh, mm. you know, I'll try something that I never thought I could do it. You know, right yes. astronomy or you know what. Something like that, you know. Right. Oh, I mean, this, this is, is my personal gut feeling. Yeah. This is the whole point of Phil's code is um, try, stop trying to build the complicated parts in hardware, move yeah. it to software, and just get uh, data points through from mm -hmm. the antenna yeah. to the to the other I radio. And that makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Honestly, with the price of these B links, you know, whatever you have now, they're going so down in price. People say, okay, I'm just going to have my ADCs or SDR doing, you know, the basic stuff and right. everything else I want to do it on my, I don't care about FPGA, you know, I just right. want to be able to do it on my computer. You know, I don't even need a GPU. I mean, actually, right. Fisco code doesn't need a GPU. So that's, yeah. I think, what's going to happen. I mean, well, again, there's an awful lot and, more. C programmers than there are GPU programmers mm -hmm. or yeah yeah or, yeah that's, that's, honestly um, yeah yeah that's absolutely right the one thing I might do is start looking at GPU is just so the stuff can run at the higher sample rates you're talking about Franco on medium sized machines yeah because yeah. GPUs do seem to be very common you know use it yeah. as an option if it's available but it could be a uh, uh, like a throughput that helps organize the stuff for your programs well i mean i would be running the big forward fft on it because right. apparently it's already yeah. been done i mean i'll do it if it's easy and if it's there why not yes 
other than that, the architecture will be the same. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing, Phil, is that uh, FFTW is already so good that I don't even need it. I know if you need it. And the <laughs> second thing is the person that can write a fast FFT, you can count uh, on the half of the finger to the hand. You know? <laughs> I don't even know if anyone here. I mean, like <laughs> New Radio use FFTW. Pretty much everybody in the world uses mm. FFTW. So unless you want to spend the next five years of your life doing <laughs> FFT. Well, my, super, my, my point is that I'm hearing of uh, of uh, versions of, well, FFTs that run on GPUs that already have the FFTW interface. Yes. That's what yeah, I they, oh. they, they If already that's available, it. then I'll use it. If not, yes. I won't bother. Those libraries are, I, I'm, I'm certain, exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if I can get everything done with the three hundred two hundred fifty dollars uh, i five or whatever is those billings so, or right, yes. why would I get a, 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 a GPU? You know, I don't well, think well, it buys much. Uh, well, you're funny. talking about higher sample rates, uh, Franco, with more data, and uh, yeah. Rob is always trying to run this on the cheapest machine he can find. So it <laughs> might be helpful. <laughs> Anybody is. I mean, who? I mean, I I I see his point. You know. Yes. Yeah, the next thing, Phil, is going to be try to run two FTs at the same time if you have two SDRs, you know, or two uh, synchronous uh, um, streams. Well, I, I do run multiple FFTs at once, right? Like I mean, big FFTs? Uh, yeah. 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 On what kind of hardware? No, I, I'd run two at one time on, on the x86 and the, and the ARM. Right. If you've looked oh, okay. at my code, I mean, you'll usually see by default the C2 FFT threads. And I do that so I can make use of multiple cores. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. The problem, the problem is, is they compete for the same memory and the same cache. So there's limited yeah. ability in that. That's the, the main problem, again, is moving the data around is things like cache hit ratios and memory bandwidth that turns out to be the real problem here. Not there, the there are, I have one, there are some bigger brothers to the uh what was the one that well the one that that phil uh harman originally demonstrated his dfc thing years ago with was a little uh nvidia tegra board which yeah. was one of their first ones they since come out with quite a few different versions kind of like an embedded their modules mostly that are uh, that are bigger and bigger and differently architectured the interface between the arms and the and the gpu cores um and their main thing is is ai type uh applications but it's I think they still do a pretty good job in most cases of DSP type stuff too. That just isn't very sexy at the moment. And uh, so like I have an Xavier uh, unit that's um, it's a generation or two back now, but it's a, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's that big. So we're on a table over there, but you know, and it, it has, well, the one I have only has 16 gigs of RAM and and I don't remember how many cores, 512 or something. But um, each one, the most important difference between those in each case is 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 the is often the the communication between the the processor, the yeah. the ARM processors, and that uh, it seems to be something that Nvidia has fought very hard on is to um how to move data across the barrier and in and out of the 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 graphics process or what was once you know the the tensor cores and all that good stuff essentially the gpu cores mm -hmm. and uh it's it how they manage that memory uh which i'm sure it's all kind of a shared memory arrangement of some kind but how they do that it seems to be something that gets better every generation, every time they change our, you know, the name. And so there's there's an Orion series after the ones I have. And they're, they're the modules that they put into the big, you know, 25,000 core, you know, supercomputers. But you can get one or two, you can get these singly that are also aimed at, at other markets like 
MR machines and and self-driving cars and stuff. And um, they're not cheap, but if you want one, I could provide an older one. That we, might, we, don't that. We, don't, we don't really need that kind of thing right now. Uh, my, no, I, if you're interested to play with that. For, yeah. With yeah. the CUDA interfaces across there. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know much about AI. It's one of those things I got to finally start learning about. My understanding is that most of the computation are extremely huge, fairly sparse matrix multiplies with low resolution. Right. Is my understanding. I don't know whether low resolution is too low for what we're interested in. I have been trying to interest Rob in half precision floating point because he has this obsession with getting floating point out of my code, which doubles the speed, you know, the, the, the data rate of every channel. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get him to play with half precision floating point. I assume that a lot of these uh, processors use that or they have make a, something smaller. I don't know. They have a wide range of, um, of floating point uh each each generation also seems to do different a different array of of um it's been a while since i thought about it, but um each generation has uh these ones have a whole array of different different uh matrix uh calculation Format. Different data formats, yeah. Yeah, data format. That's what I'm trying to say. I uh, implemented um, IEEE half precision float recently on the output stream, and I can't hear a difference. I mean, I've implemented both 32 and 16 bit floating point, and um, just for 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 a good measure, I added uh, 16 bit signed low right. low a little Indian since big Indian to default. And as expected, I can't hear any difference at all between them, and nor did I expect to. But for some reason, Rob has this obsession with wide dynamic range, so he doesn't have to modify gain. So I figured I'd give it to him. <laughs> I just there, don't want to gratuitously double the data rate on every channel for no good reason. Right. That's all. Are there useful um, things besides just that process uh, that could be done you know, if you had room and horsepower to do it, um, I mean, you're doing the big FFT. Uh, you're talking about doing the big FFT. Well, uh, right now, the other computationally intensive thing Rob does is whisper decoding. Now, yes. I haven't been into it to find out exactly where all that CPU time is going. I, uh, I will uh, mention, you know, the Michael candidate. here uh, tried your decoders. He's been looking into Rob's decoders and uh, found that there was a lot of uh, wasted cycles that he could. Uh, yeah, Rob told me up. that just by recompiling the code, he made it go a lot faster. I suspect yes. that the earlier versions were compiled with debugging on or optimization turned off yes. or something like that. So that's a simple improvement right there. Yeah. So yeah, I also see huge differences uh, when I turn off optimization. It really makes a difference. Yeah. Hmm. The modern modern compilers often vectorize things when they can, and that right there is a big speed up if yes. you can do it effectively. <laughs> I could interrupt to uh, go back to what we were talking about. I'm looking at the specs for the three types of chips. The FX5 and the FX10 look to be the same pinout, same package, same architecture. Must just be a speed difference. Um, FX3 as far as I can tell, is different. They've got different documentation on it, so it's hard to compare. But I'm not quite seeing how even the FX3 is keeping up with our uh, data rate, the way they're specking their interface. Because it says- uh, What do you mean, right? Dave? Um, what I'm seeing is, um, they say a program- I mean, the FX- Is this the GPI GPIF that we're connecting yeah. to? Yeah, and the FX3 up to can... up to sixteen configurable. Well, no, no. The, no. the FX3 but it says hundred megahertz of GPIF. Are How can we be running one hundred twenty-two? The FX5, uh, Dave. This is FX3 that I'm talking no, the about. The FX3 can this only is... okay. This is an so FX3 uh, development board right here, the one that we built. Right. No, and I understand and FX3 it, is what in what's in the RX eight eight eight. The GPIF. There's two yeah. rows, you know, kind of like a beagle bone. Um, 
of 40 pin connectors. And those... oh, I'm saying uh, the FX3 is what's in the RX888. And yeah. Yeah. from their, their banner specs on the data sheet, I don't see how we're getting 122 megahertz sampling through a 100 megahertz interface. No, no, no. The FX3, okay, the, the specs are the following. In 32-bit mode, so which would be two ADCs, right. it can do 100 mega sample per second, 100 mega sample per second. I know for a fact. Okay. In 16-bit mode, which is what the RX-88 uses, it can get at least 160, 170 mega sample per second. For okay. a fact. Well, that may be beyond their um, what they're advertising. Yeah, so they only tell you 32 bit, uh, 100 mega sample per se, 100 mega hertz per se, uh, mega hertz, which is true. I mean, I know okay. it's for it's now on the I, same if you want, I can tell, eh? yeah, okay. Um, but that was just kind of one piece of background information. Then when I'm looking at the FX10, which I might as well just be looking there, they talk yeah. about the lanes of uh. 1.25 gigabit per second. There are right. 16 lanes of 1.525 gigabit per second, but that does not support um, 16 bit at our data rate, at our sample no. rate. So that's 10 so bits. The, the, yeah, the best way to compare the two, Dave, is to look at the CMOS because the FX3 can only do CMOS. So if you want to compare apples with apples, you have to compare the 100 megahertz max 32 bit yeah, was for the FX3 too. versus the 160 megahertz for the um, so FX10. Right. So that's apple for apple. Now, if you go in uh, uh, in in LVDS, you cannot compare to the FX3 because the FX3 cannot do LVDS. So, right. Make makes sense what I'm saying. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to get this straight here. So yeah, LV CMOS. They say up to 32 bit data bus at 160 yeah. Yeah. megahertz DDR. Right. Um, now, how many lanes do you get? It only says, so, right. it's only implying one receive channel there. One channel no, there well, instead of actually 16. actually depends how you wire it because you can wi we wire. Uh, in, the, in the DFC prototype, we have wired two ADCs, one for the highest 16 bit and one for the lowest 16 bit. Right. So you can, uh, you know, uh, basically stream both ADCs at the same time. If you want to do four, then you have a different problem because right. now you can well, really fit them into a bit. See, but this is the FX10 I'm looking at, and I don't see how we get more channels into it well, than the FX3. So it depends okay, on how so, you read. It depends yeah. on how you read that uh, data interface specification. Yes, example, it does. Under LV CMOS says up to 32-bit data bus at 160 megahertz DDR RX. So does that mean there's a 160 megahertz clock and it samples on both the rising and the falling edges of that clock? If so, that's 32 bits wide by 320 megahertz. Yeah, so theoretically, through. we could get four channels into that. Right, right. So it depends yeah. on what that wording means. And it's and it's not at all clear in my view that that product brief means you know you could you could interpret it either way. So right. Need documentation on LVDS. It says up to sixteen received data lanes at one point two five. So does that mean a sixteen bit word clocked at up to one point two five in parallel across all sixteen lanes? If that's the case, then there's plenty of bandwidth. Other ways of describing LVDS are it's a single bit stream that's serialized from lower data rate inputs. And so again, the product brief is unclear as to which meaning they mean here. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So and Tom, that's what we're saying. Without documentation, we're we're kind of scratching our heads. 
Yeah. Okay. And Tom, if now, you do what you're saying the too, math, 125 times 16 makes 20 gigabit per second. So there is no way that you can get that on the 10 gigabit per second of the FX10. The FX20 exactly. probably will. Right, exactly. But you know, if, if it would support 16 in parallel, you could cut the clock down to 620 megahertz yeah. and get there. Exactly. So, and Dave, I looked at the LT2208 part. And I don't see any way to tri-state the CMOS outputs on those parts. Yeah, it does. I, I know well, we you know it does. There is a shutdown pin. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, okay. I looked at the data sheet. I couldn't find that. The shutdown. Yeah, I'll pin send you because be... I, I have it on my desk running in tri-state. Tri okay. Right. Does it do it? Yeah, on we clock already cycle thought by... about using it that way. Yeah. Does it do it on a half clock cycle period? What do you mean? Uh, the, the, uh, what's about the shutdown pin, you bring it high and then it goes tri-state. Uh, you know, you can, uh, it takes time. I don't know how long to switch from one from on to off. It's not, I don't think it's, uh, you know, on half clock. Yeah, it's got to be about three nanoseconds uh, switching time or you can't use yeah, that to yeah. multiplex the part output. I basically run it completely off when I run off the ADC because I don't want to send the stuff to the ADC. That's why I, I'm in tri-state. Tri yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's well, where the... You yeah, know, the you question is, is, you is it fast it, enough to multiplex it? Yeah, it's no, nowhere near... I wouldn't count on that. Multiplex. And Dave, um, that's what we were talking about, why we need logic in there. If yeah, we're going to have yeah. to multiplex ADCs, those those multiplexes are going to be happening on four nanosecond right. time slots. And those, you know, but there are buffers that when multiplexes that will do that. Yes, absolutely. And right. uh, you're just saying the best way to do it in high density is to throw a cheap FPGA at it. Well, yeah, there's one, you know, we, we've got to look at, you know, there are parts that will give you a 16 bit, uh, uh, you know, tristatable output with three mm -hmm. nanosecond in a single component that cost a dollar eighty or two dollars or three dollars. You know, so we you know we just need to look through all of those options. I think the good news if you're just doing multiplexing, you don't have to use intellectual property on the FPGAs. You're just using the logic gates. Right. So it's a real simple, real simple thing. Yeah, it's easy to program that. Yeah. Um yeah, and one interesting thing that you're bringing up is that the FX five and 10 have interfaces that the three do not, that sound like would be very useful for us. Yeah, what if, we're trying if you, to do. If you go at those speeds, you know, that, you know, as Franco was saying, you know, the, that part looks advantageous. So it probably is uh, important for us to determine that we can in fact get those in a timely manner. Yeah, you know, my hope is if the software architecture is highly similar, you know, that's an incredible time savings. Well, here's the question. Is the eval board available? <laughs> the data sheets aren't available. At, yeah, least, so, at least not to us. No, but if you if you look, uh, Dave, in the <clears throat> uh, Google for D DVK, FX10 DVK, you found out that if you buy a $800 camera, you can get the DVK, the development board. But right now, it's not for general public, as I was telling Nathaniel earlier. It's, uh, it's in the stage where if you are a few privileged, you can get it. Otherwise, you have to wait. Is the camera Unless that? Unless you have a friend, Dave. How much is the camera? Uh, 800 800 yeah, well, that's cheap. And that company, makes, that company right? makes very high-end cameras. <laughs> it makes very, it use, those are pretty much research-grade cameras, generally. Uh, I have friends who use them for things, and I'm surprised they're that cheap. But that may be the evolution of the interfaces to a great degree. Because the challenge with those is to get the data out of them. Um, they don't, they're not trying to do it both ways, but... Um, and that seems to be one of their target markets. Okay, this is saying that it 
this is a product announcement saying it'll be available fourth quarter of 2024. And, joining, and this was last November. Yeah, and back in November, it says engineering samples are available. So if they go out and they say they're available to the open market, if we la ask real nice, we ought to be able to get some. We yeah, know if you want. And uh, like I say, when you have to emphasize the, um, you know, yes, we're small potatoes, but we're very large in um, in uh, uh, presence, you know, doing yes. scientific research, and they can use that as part of their uh, marketing and whatnot. If they can spell it. I send you a link, Dave, of the, uh, this camera that I we keep mentioning so you can take a look at what they have. Yeah. Uh huh. That's all we have so far. And if you click on the camera, you'll see the price is eight hundred out of stock. So, um... hmm. so my plan, David, as soon as the SDK, not even the the hardware, but the software comes out, you know, we know how to do it. Start looking into that and see how close is to the FX five, FX three, and then start writing for that. So the moment that the hardware is out, we can actually play with it. I mean, it makes sense. Sure. I mean, I can compile software even without having the hardware. And FX5 seems just a, a, an advanced version of X3, Dave. So I think that uh, I suspect they're going to eventually discontinue the FX3 for the FX5 from my, my gut feeling again. Yeah, the only problem is a different package. Yeah. But they're gonna tell you for new design use FX five and right. or FX ten and for old design. Yeah, I think. But pricing is not known, so it's kind of everything's up in the air right yeah. now. Well, um, yeah, if we could back up just a little bit, I was serious about uh, wondering if we should uh, clean up the uh, one and two channel design so that we have them available because a lot of what we do, we only need one or two. But, you know, I personally want to see us go to four, and I know Bill Lyles said six. So <laughs> eight is where we should be looking. So one... Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Anthony. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, I think I am um, I need to go to sleep now, but <laughs> I want to. I'll let you guys keep going, but I want to say thank you very much, and I will see you next week. Thanks. Yeah, have a good night. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Get a good, good night. Thanks, good night. guys. Good night, Dave. Dave, good night. when you when you say uh, one or two, you mean at what sample rate and what resolution? Because you have to do the math uh, x well, times y times z, and you get the number. Well, the I'm talking number. the 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 twenty two oh eight um, function. Uh, you know the RX eight 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 is a one channel, so right. So just being able you... to duplicate that for ourselves would be great. Second, okay. to be able to do yeah. a two channel is a big plus. Okay, um, so if you ask me, Dave, if you do the math for one channel, you can fit on the FX three slash FX five because one times sixteen bit times one hundred thirty megasample per second fits in a USB 3.0. Right. If you want to do two, you're, you have to decide either less resolution or less sampling rate up to 100 megasample per second. Right. If you're okay with that, yes, you can fit with FX3, otherwise you don't, you're not. Yep. Well, that may be what uh, people could go for is, um, you know, full sample rate with one channel or a half sample rate for two. That in that case, yeah, that's three or five. At least to get something be... so that we're we're making hardware and getting 
getting people working with it. Good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Get away from the Chinese RX eight eight eight. Oh, that, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, so I just looked on the DigiKey website. The uh, FX3 chips are uh, $21.95 for the chip. Oh, my God, that's cheap. The big question is, what do we pay for the 2208s? <laughs> Well, the Chinese pay a lot less than the question are. Yeah, we know. Are they, are they genuine parts? They've been on Amazon for quite a while, too. Um, they're a little vague about which which parts, you know, which which variant they are, but they and they go up and down in price a little bit. I, I don't know if I'd buy more than one, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Has, has anybody had an RX triple eight fail that wasn't modified? I don't, I'm not aware of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do you mean modified? Well, modified for external clock. Oh, yeah. You, they were failing just by overclocking them, weren't they? Well, that's what I mean by overclocking. That was never, before we got never, the external interface onto it. That's that's never been completely clear, you know, that that was what was I'm asking. Well, you know, my memory is yes, but I don't. My memory is nobody really proved it. I bought three, but I really only been using one. It's the one I got on Amazon over a year ago. It's before Dayton last year, and it's been running fine ever since. Now, some of that time is at 130. Then I dropped it to 64.8, and it's running right now that way ever since without a problem. No hitches. So the failures, you know, my recollection is that there were two different failures. One was thermal uh, from clocking it at 120 five or 130 megahertz and i did the thermal mod to mine and the case got pretty hot after doing the thermal mod right. and it was cold before doing the thermal mod so there was a lot of power inside that thing that, that actually cold. doesn't make sense think about it the same amount of heat has to come out either way it's all coming out through the case so the case should be the same temperature yeah, whether or not you've done the thermal change right the difference yeah, will be temperature it's the time constant it's the time constant huh right uh, um, the time the time constant so over yeah a well the time period it makes a well lot it's a thermal the, resistance the thermal resistance that changes right yeah but so the, also, yeah the same amount of heat's got to come out one way or another right but the chip may be running hotter if the, exactly. the thermal resistance is not good oh, it, it doesn't make sense that the cool the case would run hotter with the extra thermal kind of the right. only difference would be the temperature difference yeah you got a point the there. chip in the case yeah. which would have to be greater yeah. to overcome a greater thermal resistance yeah. but the so what, heat what you're saying out, is the chip right. that would be hotter not the case right. not you the wouldn't case. feel it on the case well, right uh, if you if you ignore time oh it's a true statement if you take time into oh the all right not, oh yeah Good okay. Point. The second failure um, was, um, I believe, Clint isolated it to an actual chip failure on the part, and that was overdriving the external clock input. Yeah, right, right. And that actually caused the device inside the RX-888 to fail. He swapped it out, put a new part in, and restored the operation of the device what i'm getting at is that most of these failures seem actually to have been caused by improper external clocking um well at least some of them at least some of them okay i'm trying to figure out if it's maybe all of them i no, no. think it's clear that it wasn't all of them falling okay. in one or the other of those cases the majority being the overdriving the 5351 yeah. Well, from what I heard, there the one of the problems was if you had one of these devices and, and didn't put the thermal modification in, that the chips ran and you're running at full speed, the chips ran hot enough to eventually fail, like a solder joint coming apart or some such thing like that. Yeah. And some, some people's yeah, it it might you know it might yeah, I mean clearly putting in thermal pad is a good idea no matter what. It makes I'm all trying. the difference, I think. Right. I'm trying to trying to pin down whether that is really the only problem or whether a lot of problems are caused by improper overclocking yeah. or sterile blocking. Yeah. The, well, the, in my the case, problem, for instance, uh, the key problem I, is the synthesizer chip that they picked 
wasn't really designed to be externally clocked, mm -hmm. right? They do have other chips in that family that are designed to be externally clocked, but on the RX-888, what you had to do was shut down and essentially tri-state the internal oscillator and then overdrive the crystal input pins on the chip, which really weren't designed to be driven uh, by anything other than a crystal and force it to, to lock to an external reference. And so their choice of part was not the best for that particular app. Okay, I just ordered three of the Tapper external clocking kits. I assume that's the right thing to use. Yeah, I don't know. I <laughs> ordered one from Turn Island right. Systems. And well, that's what yeah, I mean. That's yeah, that's the same one. Yeah, they, yeah they, they basically have I, um, some parts in there to mitigate against. Yeah, I think he that. includes right. a DC block and attenuator. DC yeah. block attenuator, and yes, right, that's correct. Right. And and a one well, termination a termination for the external input. Right, right, and of course, you know, if we were to do our own, the idea is we'd use a different part in the family, you know, more suitable right. to that external. But this input. should work, and this should be safe. Well, well it, it actually may not right. even be a matter of a different part. It's a different program of the part. Uh, I well, think the other thing I fit. noticed is that if I do with the thermal imaging camera here, they have the voltage regulators that get hot on mine, you know? So I looked at with the imaging camera, it, they get much hotter than the 2208. So I'm not yeah. sure if it actually yeah. the problem is different. Well, so those no, things we're, have we're thermal talking limits. the interface level into the clock chip, which you would, you would think that thermal that that uh, ODOs would have, but standard would have thermal limits in them, thermal cutouts. Do they? Yes, they do. They're not going to just burn up. No, they're not. Okay, that's a good point. It's just that the, the hotter you run them, the they can fail over time. Oh yeah, sure. But they're probably not going to get hot enough to melt their own solder. Huh? Correct. Okay. No, they all have uh, thermal shutdown. Good. Okay. Which may cause a transient failure of the device, but not hopefully not a hard failure. That's, yeah, that's there's a second a second issue in that the electrolytic caps are pretty close to those regulators. Yeah, they may fail. Yeah. And they may fail. Yeah. But with a thermal pad covering the whole bottom of the board, that should be taken care of yeah over you know over a one or two minute time frame you know it th that whole pad really sucks heat out of there you can yeah. tell so yeah you were probably when you said that there was a difference in case temperature you were probably looking at the short term you didn't wait a while yes that's correct yeah okay then because you think about it right i mean energy conservation says that the case has to get warm equally warm in both cases that the thing's drawing the same amount of power right uh, yes. Um, however, you know, there's, there's lots of caveats to that statement. Well, I mean, energy conservation is always observed, right? It's just, right. Yeah. Right. You have to wait a but while for it. But the thermal, the thermal distribution inside is different. Right. Right. And I just spilled a bag of water here. God damn it. <laughs> I'll be, be right back. All right. So anyway, that was, that was, well, I think we summarized last week's discussion with Franco, uh, Dave, and I here pretty well. For what it's worth, I just put in the um, uh, in the chat thing uh, what I understand to be what the that leopard camera is moving across the USB, the samples. Um, I don't know if what I did made any sense. There may be things I don't know, but um, that, that it's a 51, 5120 uh, by 3840 pixels at 25 frames per second. Um, assume that they're using 30 bit, two bit transfers, uh, which gives us, um, 15,360 samples per second. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's just what my calculator told me. Uh, 
That's what they claim that camera does. Um, I think it's a lot more bits than that per second. No. Well, oh, that's a sample. That's 32 bit sam samples per second across the. Yeah, but did you divide by 32 or multiply by 32? I divided by 32. Yeah, well, you did. Um, what's the 49 something? Is that the pixels per second? Well, it's it's 25 frames at 5150 times. Oh, and I didn't take the pixel depth into consideration. So, right. Yeah, that's I knew there was probably something I was leaving out. So multiply by that by whatever the pixel depth presumably is, which I don't. Yeah, so that's pixels per second times, we'll say 32, it might be only 24 bits. Well, yeah. let's say 24 bits, which is one, that's 12 gigabits per second. Haven't pixels gotten smaller than that since? Or maybe this is a high precision camera. This is a no. That that's eight bits per pixel, and a lot of them are doing twelve bits per pixel or something. Okay. I mean, for color, per color yeah. per pixel. Yeah, in color. Don't they compress somehow? They there's a special encoding. I suspect this isn't not. There a may be some compression involved, though. A lot of it, especially, you know, this high resolution stuff. They probably are sending it raw. Yeah, you would not want compression. Yeah, well, it's a question I've had. I mean, looking into these smaller uh, sample formats, there there's a whole bunch of them. I was going to ask if uh, anybody who does have experience with these with uh, uh, vector processors and FPGAs knows anything about these smaller compressed floating point or integer float uh, integer um, uh, formats. There's a lot of them. Most of them come out of computer graphics and AI. I don't know. We could inquire about what these guys are talking about. Um, I can either ask my friend who does this kind of thing, or we could contact the company. I was just wondering, anybody had any personal experience with, uh, FP well, not FPGAs, but uh, GPUs that work with these smaller samples? Because they've gotten very popular, especially because of AI. Oh, yeah. That in a lot of cases, they want floating point. They want the dynamic range, but they do not need the precision. But there's a whole bunch of them now. There's at least two that I know of. There are 16 bits. I think there are some even smaller ones. I've I've dabbled with the idea of using that representation for my frequency domain signal so that I could send it over a network at, at a reasonable bit rate instead of blowing it up. You know, because I if I take the sample rate I've got now, which is 16 bits per sample, and I convert it to frequency domain. Well, the first thing I do is convert it to 32 bits before I run into my FFT, and I just take the FFT output bins and, and multicast them. I'm already, I just doubled my data rate. You know, I've gone from one gigabit to two gigabits. So I've been looking or thinking about using some of these smaller uh, compressed uh, floating point formats to do that. And I was just wondering if anybody has any experience with them. I, I know that experience, but there's lots of documentation of what they yeah. are they used. Yeah. I do know that a lot of compression algorithms uh, has, have worked, have relied on frequency, uh, conversion to frequency domain followed by quantization. You know, JPEG works that way. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering whether that means that I could take a frequency domain representation of the output of my front end and encode it with less precision and still have things work. Um, I just wonder, I mean, I can experiment with it, of course, find out whether that works, but I'm wondering if anybody's ever tried it or know of, know of it being used. Otherwise, that two to one penalty is a lot when you're talking about gigabit, sustained gigabit. Yeah. Or two. Well, you're talking about compressing the um, the raw data from the ADC or? Oh, no, uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, the ADC is time domain. I'm talking about taking that into the frequency domain and then using reduced resolution to multicast to frequency domain data mm -hmm. as a way of decoupling the front end from all the little channels that might want to use it. Right now, they have to be built in as threads in the K and IQ radio, uh, which works. But, you know, I'd like to, I've, I've been thinking about alternative approaches where uh, K and IQ radio would just multicast the, fre the frequency domain 
in uh, and, and divide it up so that receivers can simply subscribe to certain multicast groups that give them the frequency range they're interested in. So it doesn't actually have to multicast everything. Uh, but if I just take the 32-bit outputs from my uh, FFT and multicast them, I've just doubled the data rate. If it's one gigabit going in, it's two gigabits going out. And I'm already past Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet speeds anyway. So I'm just wondering if there's any experience with using these smaller floating point formats for frequency domain um, receiver data. I may just have to try it and see what works. But I, I do note, I mean, I'm not a compression expert, but I've, I've used it. I've implemented some of it when I was at work. And I do know that uh, the basic theme of a lot of these is to convert something into the frequency domain and then quantize the hell out of it. And because you don't seem to notice. Now that's 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 for human perception. I don't know whether radio receivers could could benefit from the same thing or not. Yeah, and also, well, it'd be different whether you're doing um uh data demodulation or uh research. It might, but remember the signal noise ratio of most of the signals we deal with is extremely low. I mean, look at whisper. Well, right? the problem is a lot of the the yeah. It depends on what we're using, but I'm just thinking in terms of the sorts of things we do for research, it is noise. It'd be very hard yeah, to compress much. It. Well, I mean, no, but the point is you don't have to preserve a super wide dynamic range. You know, I think Rob is, is really, you know, Rob is yeah. going off, I think, on the wrong track here. We've had this well, discussion. Well, again, you don't know that because some of the stuff is galact We The galactic noise is our signal. Yeah, but it's still noise, right? Yeah, I mean, but it's just kind of above range? the system noise is the point. No, it's okay, it's fine, way down there in the bits. That's different from you having to use 16 or 32-bit samples to encode every time domain sample, right? Right. Radio astronomers, uh, I remember having this discussion with Tom Clark about signal noise ratios versus sampling rates for radio astronomy. And at the time, they were using samples like one bit, two bits per sample. Because the signals they're dealing with are noise. Yeah, right? and if they're limited, down in the one bit level. Yeah, they are noise. I mean, statistically speaking, they are noise. Right. The noise is the signal. Right. And it, 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 it occurred to me, actually, we debated this for like a couple hours before I realized we were saying the same thing. Yeah. It's and well, that's the sort of thing that, you know, we do the same with um, sigma delta converters. Exactly. That they're actually right. one bit converters just at a high sample rate. Well, that's for that's for a narrowband signal being sampled at a high rate, but for something like radio astronomy, where, where you're looking at a the 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 the, the, noise, the signal from nature is inherently broadband noise, right? Then you don't really need to have high resolution of each sample. Uh, in his case, I think at the time this was back in the 80s and 90s, they were limited primarily by the total data rate that they could record on tape because they, they weren't using the internet yet to this was for VLBI, right? Right. And so they had a choice. I've, I've suddenly realized this later. It was an insight that came to me that if you double the number of bits per sample, that is going to have your sample rate. Uh, if you're constrained by the total number of bits per second, you can record it on a tape. Right. And if you have your sample rate that has the bandwidth that knocks down the signal power you're receiving by 3 dB, which is going to be worse than any improvement you would get by improving the number of bits per sample. And that's why they go for maximum bandwidth, even if it's only one bit per sample. Right. Those guys, yeah, yep. and that's why sigma delta converters work because uh, you you sample it at high rate and then you filter it down. I think that's a out ahead. It may be related. I I think it's a somewhat different yep. uh, problem, but it's a related problem with sigma delta. But with any kind of 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 A to D process, when you are when you are quantizing, you're introducing sample noise. The sample noise is going to be spread out over the over the bandwidth of whatever the data rate, the sample rate is, and so by making that wider, you spread it out thinner. Right. And so when you look at only a piece of it, it there's very little. That, that's basically another way of stating the sigma delta thing, right? Yeah. Well, another thing trick that's Crossing done with sigma delta is you do it in such a way that your noise is out of your band of interest. Right. You're shaping it. Right. You're shaping so it shaping and you can and uh, filter it out. Making it wide, yeah. Right. So Rob, Rob has been, I wish he was here, Rob has been obsessed by, you know, quantizing noise. And I think part of his problem is he always insists on running his signals right up near the top of the 100 dB dynamic range that you get out of 16-bit linear PCM. 
And I always thought that he's handicapping himself by doing that. I mean, he's got a hundred DVD well, dynamic here. Why not use it? It does the signal doesn't have to come out. You yeah, know. but you have to think it's about not. how many signals you're trying to encode in that. It doesn't matter, right? As long as the signal has a low has a signal noise ratio of less than 100 dB, and it's not clipping, right? Then 16 dB bits should be enough. You know, I finally gave him the 32 bit float mode mode that he wanted, but I really don't think it'll make any difference. But I I gave it to him basically just so he can go off and see that it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> Sometimes that's easier. That's right. Yeah. Maybe. But at the same time, I wanted to give him this half precision float mode just so we can compare the two and see that. Yeah. It's well, good. It's good to problem. compare it. Yeah. I mean, certainly just listening by ear, I can't hear a difference. I can't hear a difference in any of the four modes. 16 bit fixed, or, you know, the two floating point modes sound exactly the same to my ear anyway. Um, I haven't beaten the subject to death. Um, that camera specifically says that it is, it doesn't say what size, but it says raw, um, uh, uncompressed pixels. Right. Because that could still be a different number of pixels per red, green, and I mean, bits per red, right. green, you know. Yeah, but it, 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 it yeah. Presumably, it is a color camera, right? Oh, it is a color. It is color. It very specifically says that. It just doesn't say how many bits of each color it's grabbing. But I think in this context, it probably has a standard meaning. I just don't know the context. Yeah. The, the robotics world there. There. Yeah, I thought there was a standard pixel format for color where they allocate more bits to green than they do for red and blue, but. I'm not a video guy anymore, so I don't uh, know. I think that was when things were really tight, you know, tighter than they are these days. But I don't know. Well, I know they allocate more pixels to green. You know, if you look at a Bayer filter, half the pixels are green, a quarter are red, and a quarter are blue. So I think on on the video stuff, um, the lower resolutions on on some of the color stuff is is human perception again. You mm -hmm. know, black and white high, is high resolution, and when you get into color, it's lower resolution. So they cut the color resolution in half. Yeah. Right. I think we have more rods than we do cones. I think that's it. Plus, they're much more sensitive. Correct. Well, have we beaten the horse? Probably. Probably. For this oh. week. I'm going to head out. Y'all take care. Yeah, Dave. Very good.